Okay, so welcome uh, to part two of our conversation. And so in this part, we're going to build on some of the conversations we've been having about audience and speak a bit more to the ways that you're thinking about diverse and broad audiences in the museum education space. So maybe let's start with a fairly general conversation about the role of audience in the way that you're all thinking about crafting museum education programming. Uh, one of the most rewarding but also challenging things that we can think about in regards to museum education is that unlike classroom teaching where we have serial classes, we meet weekly, bi-weekly, we get to know one another really well, and the courses are tied to a grade, so you have a sort of built-in assessment. In the case of museum education, you're often working with a group of individuals that you don't know is probably the first, it could be the first time you've met them during that program, um, and they come from all walks of life, which is often the case with our students as well, but you may not know as much, right, because you haven't gotten to know them. Um, so how has the way that the museum uh, audience can be so broad influence the ways that you facilitate conversations around uh, histories of violence, histories of oppression, histories that might be traumatizing? And maybe this is more speaking to a technique um, than a program. A general technique is I tend to uh, ask a question about what people see right up front. And I ask them to keep it to a single word. If you had to describe this work to someone who couldn't see it in a single word, what would you say? So then we're all just sort of gathering and then I'm really bald about saying, so we see as we're standing, we might have the same sense of thinking about scale or thinking about form or thinking about this, but the ways that we decide that we're going to characterize those details is very different. And then I also always offer definitions of complex terms. If I say post-colonial, I say by that I just mean histories that are written or visualized by the colonizer and those colonized. Um, and, and, you know, or give some way of grounding. If I say Afrofuturism, I try to give a sentence just so that there's no expect, no one feels like they're like, oh, well, I should know what that means. Um, or the folks who think they know what it means, but <laughs> I like something different. Uh, uh, with my student guides, we are working on social justice projects and we gave them some really foundational readings. We gave them Howard's in the people's history. And they were like, well, I feel like I already know about this or that, or I know how to talk about intersectionality. And I said, so if, one of our visitors walked up to you and asked you to define intersectionality, what would you say? Nothing. So there's a way in which uh, making sure that we are defining our terms just so that we're all in the same um, page. I think that's really come up in the virtual tours that we're doing now. So we've shifted completely, I mean, we've been closed. So we've done all video-based tours now and our audience is really broadened. We're getting audiences from all over the country. We're getting a lot of corporate audiences as well mm. and then students of all ages. And so one thing that comes up in having these conversations is that perhaps maybe the organizer or the contact of the group wants to avoid a certain topic, um, which is really difficult to do given the two exhibitions that we have right now, which is about the transnational experience of Oaxacan migrants to LA and also the survivors of the Pinochet regime. So what we've done is that we've worked with our docents in, um, I guess, creating these like, not scripts, but these uh, tour frameworks mm -hmm. that emphasize more general topics or more general approaches. So for example, uh, talking about the elements of art in building a story and then letting the audience kind of come to that story by analyzing the shape, color, and then the narrative in there. Um, or for example, the one about migrants, instead of, maybe focusing from the get-go on the sort of political reasons as to why people migrate, um, centering more on the idea of home and what home can be and how home can be more than one place. And then again, letting the audience kind of lead that conversation going from there. So I feel like uh, even if you don't, you know, from the start kind of like set that agenda and talking about these traumatic experiences, I think just by creating sort of the safe space again and um, presenting them with more general topics, the audience eventually gets there on their own. And then it's helpful to have somebody on hand to kind of lead that conversation as well as we get there. I, I for me, I've learned, this is not my own knowings, but I've <laughs> learned a lot from my uh, the 
the art therapist, Sarah Pusti, and also our new director of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access, uh, Kiana Hendricks, who is also a nationally known consultant on issues of um, anti-racism in museums. And so for like specifically personal trauma, we've been thinking about this because our program was finally green lighted kind of to address the, the election. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so we went from doing like on the ground, trying to understand what our specific Brooklyn Museum audience, Brooklyn audience might need, and then being launched on a day when it was like a national issue, like people wanting to like deal and like hold space for their trauma like on a national scale. Um, and so one of the things um, we talked about is, okay, are we going to do community agreements where we say out front, up front, we will not, you know, tolerate discrimination or inflammatory language, because at least at the beginning, there were a lot of Zoom calls that started with like, you no know, Zoom bombing here, please. Um, and we decided, really, it was the art therapist who was like, who kind of warned us against doing that, because um, from a therapeutic standpoint, it's understood that trigger warnings often actually raise anxiety, and we don't actually know where people people are coming from. We don't know what their intentions are. And so to like start with, you know, a, something that might feel like, hey, we know that you're, you know, there's some issues going on, make, might make everybody feel like, oh no, I'm in a room where we're about to have like a very crazy conversation as opposed to um, a shift to something like um, remember to take care of yourself or um, another one, another community agreement that Sarah uses is practice active listening, right? And so the, and so yes, obviously we still need to be ready and in, in like game out the possibilities of something um, happening. But um, we start with uh, invitations to come into brave spaces or safe spaces um, rather than setting people on edge right away. And then if something comes up, I turn to Kiana Hendricks learnings, which is, you know, really thinking an in, in internal reflective process where it's like, who's hurt, who's harmed and who's helped by what's happening, you know, and thinking about that as it's happening, like what will your silence do? And what are the consequences of making it up to either not doing anything or doing, or doing something? So thinking really about like who has power in that situation and thinking about how your actions could um, redistribute that power or set things a a little bit more equitably as a facilitator. Yeah, can, can I build on that just to, mm -hmm. to say I, this idea of community agreements and how we, we sort of set those forward. I'm, I'm going back to that program, Community Conversations, and we, in a couple of spaces I've been in, we've worked on, on this idea that, um, to you, sort of like the, the same point, not starting out with the kind of trigger warning sort of aspects, but also holding space for this idea that we're, we're going to assume the best intentions first or, or some better language than, than, than I'm using right in this moment. But, you know, really calling out the fact that if we are having an open conversation in the moment that people aren't going to use the right words, you know, that it takes time to formulate the right sentence. And if you're grappling with an idea or if you are triggered, you might, there might be outbursts, there might be emotions. And it's not that we or blind to that, or we, we let that go. It's a matter of that we don't start with the reaction of that was meant as harm. We, we, we actually do take a moment to sort of, to question the intent as well as acknowledge the impact. So it's, it's, it's taking a moment for that care to, to, to really acknowledge the, the, the harm that can be done in this space, but also unpacking what, what, what was actually meant. What were the, what was, um, was it a matter of you just don't have the right words right now or that sentence that you put together was a bit awkward because I, I think we've all been in that situation where man in our heads, it really sounded perfectly, but when we get that word out there, it was a jumbled mess. And now I've said five things and I ended up attacking someone. And that's, that's not where I was coming from. I was responding to my own sense of, of, of perhaps trauma or, or anxiety or, or what, you know, um, I, I was interestingly just sort of thinking about this thing of how do we hold space to care for victims when, you know, and acknowledging the fact that so often the people that are doing harms are victims themselves, you know, so how do we sort of allow for, um, in our conversations when we don't know a lot about people that are coming into our space, especially group dynamic, kind of almost holding everyone in that space that everyone has that potential to be both aggressor and victim. And, and we'll probably, as we talk about intersectionality, we'll probably be both multiple times throughout a single conversation, you know, depending on what topic is being discussed at any moment. Thank you so much. I mean, these responses were all fantastic. And I'm seeing so many connections back to part one where we were talking about space for making mistakes, 
building communities so that people felt like they could try, um, even though they know they might not right always get it right on the first time. Um, and then about not making assumptions, not only about prior knowledge, right, which is good practice in so many ways in educational spaces of all kinds, but about what will be traumatizing for um, different people that you might encounter, right? Um, and then just to bring it back to the beginning, because I think it's an important one to draw out, uh, the sort of beauty that can come from anchoring in the object, right? And the way that that can be such a valuable tool across, again, across educational spaces, because it's so valuable, as you've been describing in the museum education space, um, but also for, you know, anyone teaching in a classroom of, of any kind. Um, so thank you so much. Those are all wonderful. And it might be nice, actually, I heard some themes resonating with our next question when you all were talking about, um, especially in our given remote uh, moment right now, the way your audience seemed to be shifting. Um, so to broaden our conversation about audience, um, museums often aim to reach broad international publics, but they of course also call a certain city, town, or neighborhood home, and many institutions aim to intentionally speak to their local communities. So as museum educators, how do you shift your pedagogies to best serve your respective local or international audiences and, and anywhere in between, right, these diverse audiences you might be encountering um, and meeting? And of course, these things could overlap, especially uh, now in our remote world. Um, so how do you balance these potentially competing needs? Do they sometimes overlap more than you expect? Um, do you find your programs cultivating a more global community in maybe surprising ways, especially now that we've moved remote? So if I can jump in first, I, I, this, this is the question I've been waiting for because I, I have um, <laughs> I have I have sort of half formed theories and maybe not solid solid notions of, of this yet. But I'm a big fan of the half baked thought. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. <I still> um, <laughs> the things that I've been thinking about recently um, is is one sort of separating audience and community out a little bit. So you know because I, I do you know, there, it's not to get into like marketing language, right? But I do believe in this sort of understanding that like an audience is sort of who we're talking to, right? Who sort of engages in stuff versus a community where to me, that's much more of a relationship and that's an ongoing relationship. And there's, mm -hmm. there needs to be mutual benefit. There needs to be power sharing and structure sharing and, and a, a deeper thing that exists over time than maybe what would with an audience. An audience can become a community and vice versa and all that. Um, so, so, so laying that out there, I also really question um, the sort of classical museum's notions of a broad audience. I, I think it's, um, quite frankly, a, a term that we use to get out of being specific, to get out of actually paying attention to what's around us. It's, it's I, you know, th there's, a, there's a classic model that um, was once true that to be a good city, you needed, uh, or a great city, right? You needed to have a great sports team, a great ballet, a great orchestra, a great museum. And it had nothing to do with whether you engage with any one of those things. It's just the fact that they needed to be great and you supported them because they had to be great because that's what it meant to be a great city. And we, we live in a different age now where we really think about what is my actual involvement with these things? Do I, how do I feel when I'm engaging with them or do I engage with them at all? Do I feel welcome to engage with them at all? That's what makes it great. You know, that's what makes the city great. My ability to, to communicate and to engage with this stuff. This is my rambling to say that um, I, I, I think there's a countless examples of that when we invest in the local and when we think about the specificity that comes with investing in the local that we actually engage a really broad audience that people across the world, particularly in this virtual space, are more apt to engage in things that are coming from a specific point of view and discussion or a specific awareness than this idea of the thing that is just kind of meant for everyone. And my sort of I'm laughing to myself because if one of one of my colleagues watches this, she knows is exactly like right now she knows exactly what example I'm going to bring up because I use it all the time, but I think about, um, I think about the film Black Panther and, and the, the comic book movie that was so unapologetically Black and wonderfully Black and like, I mean, just, and specifically the word Black in a thousand different ways, and it was appealing on such an intense scale. And nothing about, uh, in my opinion, I mean, I think we, we can always debate like the perfection of anything, right? But like, I don't feel that it shied away from, from its Blackness and its, and its embodiment in that, that position. And, and it was, I believe it was successful because of that. I believe that a larger audience engaged in it because of that. And I think that's actually true with a lot of superhero movies that they stopped at some point, stopped trying to be the movie that everyone loved. And they're like, 
we just want to make a superhero movie for people who really love superhero movies. And then everyone else is like, that's kind of cool. And I, I want to see a superhero movie about superheroes, you know? Um, so, and I, I think museums can really learn from that. I, I, I think there is something in that that translates. And, and maybe it's, now I'll give you one more example. We did a, an event with um, the local house and ball communities, house and ball being, you know, if you've, Yes, for those who know, anyone who's watched like RuPaul's Drag Race and the, the idea of the category is, it's where voguing comes from. It's, it's you know, um, what was and maybe in some ways still is underground, you know, section of the gay community and really particularly um, for, for queer people of color as a, as a space for themselves that, that wasn't allowed in sort of mainstream gay culture. But the, the point being is that we did a wonderful program uh, with the local Philadelphia house and ball community. And again, it was so wonderfully specific. That's what it was about. It was about that community being inspired by one of our fashion exhibitions, but it just, it was all the specific language, all the specific actions, the snapping when someone does a death drop, like all of the, the calls and responses, all of it was just there. And we had a huge audience and people really were like, I don't know what I'm watching, but I love it. And I'm super into this, what is going on? And I don't think it would have been as successful if we had tried to make it this other more mainstream thing. I don't have anything to add. I just am really grateful, um, Damon, that you said that because that's something I've just been wrestling over, particularly in Zoom, where I am getting people from France, um, you know, just internationally and also just across the country. And so I've had this discussion about, well, do we want to center a particular audience or are we really trying to like, you know, make this open to everybody? For me, I was sort of saying, well, you know, there's so many people who don't feel like they belong in museums. We're a Brooklyn museum. Our brand is about being, you know, uh, responsive to our community and also thinking about wanting to support um, for example, we were think, I was thinking about black women, essential workers or black people and black women in the healthcare industry in particular as maybe an audience I wanted to like reach out to more um, strategically. And so um, when we were having a reflection, we, um, my social work intern was saying, no, we really need to find, you know, create obviously uh, access points. So maybe we need subtitles or turning on the caption so that our international audience can follow along more clearly with the discussion um, and, and really pushing us to do that. At the same time, I was like, well, let's think about this. This is a museum program. Museums typically attract pretty affluent, you know, audiences. I'm you know, I'm fairly sure that the woman who's zooming in from France, like, you know, if I'm going to pick who I'm going to center, if I'm going to divide my attentions in terms of like how I'm going to support all these people, am I really going to say, hey, woman from France, um, you know, it, it, let me center her voice in a way that maybe means like not giving as much time to like this really, you know, like, adamant black woman who came to a couple of our programs, um, young black woman who is based in Brooklyn. And I know it doesn't have to be either or, but that's why I like, um, I'm really appreciative of what Damon was saying about the way that specificity in a community can actually be an access point. And um, in that same conversation, Sarah Pusti, um, the art therapist was like, now think about how lucky that French woman was to hear what this young woman was from who was adamant in Brooklyn, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I don't have any answers, but it's just something I'm really I'm wrestling over. Can I do one more sentence just to, to add that? I, I do think spec specificity to me does not mean exclusion. And I think that's what you were just sort of talking about, that it's like, it gets lumped into that category right away. And I think this gets into where we talk about like equity, you know, where, where people want to kind of like create this sort of even playing field. Um, but that doesn't address the equity issues, right? You know, that doesn't express the history and, and systemic issues. So I, I think there is something that we're talking about something different. I think what you sort of beautifully were talking about, like you're talking about specificity specificity, but you're not talking about exclusion. We're not saying you can't be here. And, and actually we're saying part of the reason why I would argue why you want to be here is because this is doing something specific. Sorry, the risk of adding on to that. Like I've chosen all black women artists so far <laughs> and everybody loves it. Like people are saying, I'm so excited to learn new things. We have obviously a multicultural audience coming, but it's it's so exciting to be able to, you know, uh, focus on these on this specific set of artists and, and highlight their work. So um, I, I hope that ties in with what Damon is saying about um, the, the way that um, specificity is not exclusion. 
All right, I just wanted to connect to what both Dalila and Damon said, because I think of it in two ways. First, I, when you're thinking, when you're talking about specificity and how you are doing this program, Dalila, that is exclusively looking at Black women artists, I think about the first time I walked into the Spelman Museum and my boss at the time looked at me and said, you're going to leave me and go work here, aren't you? Because it was like this weird, I was just sitting there. She was like, you look so happy. And it was because they're collecting they're, they're collecting practices, only collecting women artists from the diaspora. That's it. No explanation, no justification, no any of it. And it just felt really great to be in a space where there wasn't an apology or a this is in turn for diversity or whatever, the, those kinds of. So I, but their audience is not exclusively Spelman students. They get they have an international audience and now recognition by funders and all of those things. But I also think that sometimes what I'm resisting in that idea of, you know, Black folks talking about Black things is then I have these strange conversations because part of my responsibility is thinking about how we build pathways into museum and art history careers. And the idea that uh, to expand diversity, there has to be a position in African American art. And I'm like, okay, yes, but also, what about one of the most brilliant scholars of European art I know is a queer black man? Like, what, what about, so it's also about being in the Renaissance galleries and talking to everyone about what is the economy that made all this opulence happen. So that even if you don't see yourself, we're still there. And how and how can we, that attraction you have to John Singer Sargent's way of manipulating pigment, that's a good enough reason for your black and brown self to want to talk about this. So I think that, you know, it's 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 both it's both opening up. This does, my, one of my favorite activities is to stand in our contemporary galleries and ask an audience, so what works in here were created by Black artists? Because if there's not a Black person in it, people have this assumption that they didn't make it. So how do we sort of bring, it, it's, it's, I think, connects to the larger programs that both Damon and Delila are talking about, but then also round bringing us back to that technique. How do we open up both spaces? I think also in assuming that our audiences don't want to see the specific experience, we're selling them short as well. I know that we do a bilingual summer art camp and it is centered on the Latinx experience, but we get children of all backgrounds there. And when I talk to parents about why, you know, they're signing their kids up for it, you know, like, oh, what interested you in this particular program? They just say like, I want my children to understand the community that we live in. And I want my children to be able to communicate with our neighbors in a way that makes them understand their culture and their background better, you know, so that we can have a better and more thriving community. And so I don't know, I think sometimes maybe we make the worst assumptions about our audiences. Um, and really that that's what they hunger for. They just want to create those connections. And it creates pathways, right? Like when I think Keija, that's, that's, so I, I would advocate not, not deleting that rambling because I, I loved it. And it was just so much about that, that possibility. Cause I mean, I think that, that you, specificity I think can actually open up pathways and you're not limited in your specificities, right? Like, I mean, I, I fully reject any notion that as like, uh, you know, well, as 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 a black queer educator myself, that like that that is my like limited purview of conversation. You know, um, I can be very specific about other things as well. You know, and I and it's but but I, I what I got from what you were talking about is like how how that generates pathways because like people start finding their connections, right? And then it's like, what are those threads that we? I mean, this is I feel like this is what education is, right? We get to pick up those threads and then go to other places with it. We get to go on other journeys. We get to take people along. That's that's. See, this is why I'm getting excited. Like this is this is what education is, I think, at its finest. Like that's that's where the magic actually happens. I love you're describing that, Damon, as magic, especially in relation to the way that Dalila and Gabriella and Kijo were framing um, uh, this conversation, just because 
I think back about when I was a student and it was moments of magical connection in front of objects with, you know, with other people facilitating those conversations. Those are the things that stick with me, right? Those are the ones that are sort of like light bulb moments in my head that I always remember. Um, it is magical, right? Um, it's transformative. Um, so I, I love that. I love that, that phrasing. It's really beautiful. Um, and it might actually be a nice moment to transition to a last uh, question related to audience. Um, and this picks up on some of what we had been talking about uh, in part one and also a little bit now in part two. But when we're thinking specifically about community and audience and the ways that they can intersect uh, with the exploration of difficult histories and trauma, one of the things that comes to mind is the kind of vulnerability that someone needs to access um, as an educator, as a participant, uh, as they work through content that might be challenging to them or emotional responses to objects even places, geographies, um, or uh, uh, particular programs. So maybe if we could, uh, I know we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if we could specifically hone in on how some of you might work to produce a space where your patrons can feel vulnerable in these ways, or where you, um, you know, demonstrate vulnerability in these ways. Uh, and if maybe if any of your programs have directly addressed uh, this idea of creating space for vulnerability. One of the things that my team has really reflected on is the ways that Zoom has a huge number of, of limitations, but this is actually one place where um, where there's actually something that you can't get in real life, which is you can protect yourself, but still be a part of the conversation, right? You can be completely like physically if you were in a space you'd have if you didn't feel like you felt comfortable in the room or you didn't want to talk you'd have to like make yourself small squeeze to the back of the group and then you couldn't hear or you couldn't or you were like not really you know if they broke out into groups you would not be paired with somebody or you know you'd just be left out but here you know although it presents the challenge of not being able to read body language and stuff like that you know there are a lot of people who participate with their cameras off they have their mics off they never speak in the group and yet we have a sense somehow that they have gotten something out of it whether they're putting something in the chat or maybe we just know that they were there for the entire time right and so it it offer and i and i guess that's something yeah it just offers an opportunity to to just come as you are in a way that's less possible in real life um, and you don't have to like you can you can choose your level of the way of engagement so that's one thing and then other kinds of things that we just use is like breakout rooms we always do an icebreaker one-on-one -on -one icebreaker at the start and so right at the very beginning rather than being in a room with a hundred people you're in a room with just one other person and that helps us set the tone right away that this isn't going to be like a tv watching experience that so many webinars feel like it's going to be actually in, in an interactive experience where their voice really matters and, and like their sharing is what's foregrounded um, Gabriella, I would love you to invite you to comment on maybe how you're working with the mentors here as well, because it, I think um, that's another facet of museum education that kind of like behind the scenes, like the vulnerability needed to like help mentor people and think of, it kind of dovetails back with that conversation about pathways. Sure. Yeah. Um, I guess for me, it's more about creating those one on one relationships, particularly with um, the students that come through that I work with directly and opening myself up and opening my past experiences. So just talking about my personal life, talking about the issues or the trauma that I faced as well. Um, a lot of young people come and talk to me about maybe mental health issues that they're going through. And so also opening myself up and talking about my experience with that as well and sharing some of the strategies that, that have worked for me. Um, but I think just like, I don't know, I, I think that the most positive experiences that I've had is when I haven't come trying to pretend that my experience has been different from them, um, but really just going into detail as to, you know, who my parents are and how they grew up and um, where I went to school and the challenges that I faced um, and just being 100% honest with them, right? And making them see that, um, I don't know, if we've shared those experiences that there's also room or space for them in this field. 
Thank you so much uh, for those wonderful responses. We'll wrap up part two here. Um, and I hope you'll join us for part three.